Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, for me, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to the conference, Next Generation Central Banking, Climate Change, Inequality and Financial Stabil Instability. My name is Barbara Unmusik, and I'm the president of the Heinrich Bill Foundation. This is probably the first really big conference in Europe on the responsibilities of central banks beyond price stability. It's also so far the biggest event of the project transformative responses to the crisis that the Heinrich Böll Foundation and Finanzwende started in spring 2020. The purpose of the project transformative responses is to develop and advance new ideas that could help Europe move forward on the much needed socio-ecological transformation of our economies in the context of the crisis induced by the virus COVID-19. The pandemic has triggered the sharpest global economic recession, at least since World War II, some say since the 18th century. Once again, as in 2008, it was central banks that came to the rescue, avoiding a meltdown of the global financial system and providing massive stimulus to our economies. Still, the crisis is not over yet. Europe is experiencing a double dip recession at the moment. But the very necessary and unavoidable actions of central banks have massive side effects. It has been shown that cheap money is fostering asset price inflation. Those who own assets like real estates or shares benefited handsomely. Multi-billionaires like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos increased their obscene wealth in a crisis that ruined at the same time a vast number of existences, while at the same time housing or farmland became significantly more expensive for tenants. Inequality very much increased, and this equality is undermining our democracies. As Oxfam in its recent report stated, COVID-19 is a virus of inequality. Huge bond buying programs subsidize corporations who issue bonds, putting smaller businesses at a further relative disadvantage. All the while, central banks have been shown to fuel the climate crisis by financing fossil fuel companies and disregarding climate risk in the way they treat fossil assets as collateral. The transformation of our economies towards zero emissions is not only, but also a huge investment challenge. Monetary policy will be one of the tools that our societies need to wield to face it. Time is incredibly short and we will need all hands on deck. Central banks, of course, have unique power in modern societies. They can create money out of nothing. By doing so, they can't be neutral. They inevitably have significant impacts on our societies and economies. So central banks are hugely powerful. They are indispensable tools of a modern state. Their actions have massive distributional and environmental impacts, but Central banks are often treated as poorly technocratic institutions that stand above the political system, above governments, above parliaments, and maybe even the courts. In the ECB, the model of the independent central bank, which is historically never, uh, relatively new, has been enshrined most vigorously. We think this contradictory situation calls first and foremost for a rigorous societal debate about the purpose of the central banks 
a debate about their impact upon important societal challenges that threaten our democracies and the condition of human existence on this planet, and a debate about the way central banks relate to democratic decision making. This conference aims to be the place for this debate, and we are happy that over 1400 people have registered for this event. This is huge and I'm overwhelmed. And if I'm not mistaken, it's probably one of the biggest public events on central banking in recent memory. To conclude, I would like to thank a lot of people who contributed to this, I would say even historical moment. I'd like to thank on this occasion to our partners in this ambitious undertaking, first and foremost Finanzwende, but also all our European network partners, E3G, Finance Watch, New Economics Foundation, Positive Money Europe, Sustainable Finance Lab, Center for the Sustainable Finance at Soas University of London and the Weblen Institute. I'd like very much to acknowledge the contribution of Adam Tuz, Daniela Gabor, and Pierre Monin, who have been instrumental in conceptualizing this conference. A look at the program reveals a very broad lineup from central banks, academia, think tanks, and civil society. Thank you very, very much for all those who are going to contribute the coming two days. We regret that none of the invitees from the current leadership of ECB accepted our invitation to speak here, despite our best efforts to make their participation possible. I really regret this very much. And of course, I also would like to thank the authors of the background papers, Jens van Kloster, Benjamin Brown and Daniela Gabon for their very important intellectual contributions. And of course, I also would like to thank our co-funders of the project Transformative Responses to the Crisis. This is to name it Open Society Foundation, Hans Böckler Foundation, Partners of a New Economy and Fondation Charles Leopold Meyer pour le Procret de l'Homme. Last but not least, a big thanks definitely goes to the organizing team of this conference. Michael Peters, Markus Wolf, Magdalena Sen from Finanzwende, and Fiona Hauke and Jörg Haas, as well as Julia Reiter and Sabine König from the Heinrich Böll Foundation. My thank goes very much, of course, to the leader of the transformative, transformative project, Gerhard Schick, who unfortunately was forced today to cancel his participation on short notice. It's a pity, but we all understand. We are looking forward now to a two day, to do to two days filled with panel debates and workshops with high level speakers from academia, central banking, political leaders and civil society. I very much hope that you enjoy our program. And it's now my great pleasure to hand over to Jörg Haas from the Heinrich Böll Foundation, who briefly will introduce to you the first panel. And once again, I'm very thankful and I am very grateful this, this debate is starting right now. All the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. Yes, my name is Jörg Haas. I'm also from Heinrich Böll Stiftung and my task is to introduce quickly our panelists. In this panel, we want to look back at the events of March 2020, almost a year ago, and how COVID-19 reveal, revealed some of the major instabilities of our financial system, specifically in shadow banking and the US Treasury market. We have wonderful guests to discuss this with us today. Annette wissing jorgensen is a professor for finance and management at the University of California, Berkeley. She recently published a paper on the turmoil in the bond markets in spring 2020 and the response of the Federal Reserve. Martin Helwig is former director 
of the Max Planck Institute for Collective Goods and a true financial markets expert. His uh, academic career involved several renowned universities such as Stanford, Princeton and Harvard. Sven Giegold is a long standing member of the European Parliament since 2009 for the German Greens and he is chairman of the Green Group in the Committee on Economic and Financial Policy of the EP. And Adam Tooze, he is economic historian and professor at the Columbia University in New York. His best-selling book, Crashed, analyzed the 2008 financial crisis and its consequences. And he's currently writing a book on the COVID-19 crisis with the title, Shut Down. Adam, I am handing over to you to introduce this discussion further. Thank you. No, well, thank you. Thank you, Jörg. I hope you can hear me okay and see. Um, thank you to both you and to um, Barbara and indeed to the Heinrich Boll Stiftung altogether for organizing this uh, event. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you over the last couple of years. And I think it is indeed urgent and important that civil society groups, political organizations, and nowhere more so than in Germany, engage with the questions of the politics of um, central banking and of finance and do so in as intelligent and informed a way as we possibly can. So bringing together the kind of panel that we have here of brilliant academic expertise, uh, considerable expertise, in fact, in the realm of macro prudential supervision and management in the form of Martin Helbig, and then activist politicians like Sven Giegold. It's really, it's really a great setup. It's a great um, forum for the discussion that we're going to have. The theme that we've picked out, I have to say, is also pleasingly technical. And what I hope that we're going to be able to do is to unwrap this for a broader audience, spell out to our listeners why this issue that we've singled out might matter and perhaps tease out some of its broader implications, um, not just for the United States, but also for, for Europe and, and beyond. Um, what we decided we would, we would think about is the turmoil in the US market, the Treasury market in March 2020, and why this matters, why this is thought to matter as much as it did, because this is a subject that is being vigorously argued and debated by people at every level of government in the United States and by a large expert community right now. So this is a question that is still up for grabs and we have some of the leading experts on this issue with us on this panel. The white reason why it matters is that the US treasury market in the order of about $20 trillion. So in German, that's billionen, thousand milliarden, a thousand billion. So $20,000 billion worth of US securities are generally considered to be the safe assets of the financial system, the ones that can be most easily uh, swapped into ready cash. Crucially, you should be able to swap them into ready cash without your decision to do so affecting their value. So they are, if you like, everyone's piggy bank. And so complicated portfolio decisions are based on the possibility of swapping your reserve holding of US treasuries into cash. They're very close to cash, but they pay a little bit of they pay a little bit of interest. So they are absolutely fundamental to the global financial system. And the turmoil that we saw in that market in March sent shockwaves at the deepest level through the policy community and indeed into policy action. And we can judge the scale of it in part by the scale of the Fed's response, which was a mammoth treasury buying drive, the dwarf far larger than that that followed 2008. So um, I think the way that we'll play this is that I'll ask Annette, who has done a brilliant paper on this incident, to lay out some of her results for us, to give us an introduction into the drama. And then I'll ask Martin and Sven to come in and start giving us their reactions to her diagnosis and how the situation looks from their point of view. So Annette, if I can ask you to kick things off for us. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation to speak. I'm going to share my screen. There's an issue with the share screen. Okay, there you go. 
All right, you're seeing this very well? Okay. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Michael Peters invited me to speak on the topic of what exactly happened in the treasury markets last spring. I'd like to show you a bunch of graphs to spell out exactly what happened. Uh, that's going to show that there was something odd going on with the pricing. And then I'm going to get into supply and demand. I'm going to talk you through who was selling treasuries in order to create these dislocations in the market. And then finally, I'm going to show you a few graphs to uh, talk through the impact of the Federal Reserve in terms of coming to the rescue of the market and draw a few implications for potential regulations. So here's really the picture to get us started. In the blue line, you can see the yield on 10-year US Treasury. So that's the return you could earn if you held to maturity. And in the red line is a stock index, the US stock index, the S&P 500. Now, as you can see in February, as the COVID crisis started, the both of the lines are going down, the stock market is going down, long rates are going down. That's what normally happens when you have a crisis. Then around March 9, something strange starts happening. You can see the blue line suddenly spikes up by about 64 basis points, which is an enormous amount in bond market uh, terms. And then within a week or two after that, it's back down and has stayed down for the rest of the year. So what I'd like to talk through is what exactly happened to the treasury market from March 9 to March 18. And just by way of facts, these, this odd spike in treasury yields was uh, concentrated towards the longer end of the maturity spectrum. You see larger spikes here for the 30 year and the 20 year yield uh, than even for the 10 year. So let's start thinking about what exactly happened. So again, here I'm showing you the blue line is a 10 year treasury. Now one could, one could uh, suspect that perhaps the reason that yields suddenly spiked up was because people were concerned about inflation spiking. So I put in red a market-based measure of expected inflation, I call an inflation swap. And you can see actually that that's not the case. So if anything, expected inflation went down during that critical period in March. So high inflation was not the reason that you see higher treasury yields. Similarly, I put a market-based measure of the default risk on US government bond in greens from credit default swaps. And for that, there's not much going on. So if we wanted to construct a summary measure of how distorted were treasury prices back in March, one thing we could do is to take the treasury yield and subtract out inflation and credit risk. That's what I'm showing you in black. And you can see that there the spike is even more than a whole percent. And in fact, it very, moves very similar to if you had taken a measure of the real interest rate from the inflation protected securities market in orange. So in other words, the problem was not that investors lost confidence in treasuries in any sort of fundamental way in terms of inflation and credit risk, but rather that there was something strange going on with pricing relative to those perceived fundamentals. So who was selling? So as Adam said, this treasury market is about a $20 trillion market. And the main three sellers in the first quarter of 2020 were foreigners, so the rest of the world. They sold 287 billion. Uh, they actually sold 300 billion of securities longer than one year maturity, so the longer securities where we saw these dislocations. The second biggest seller was mutual funds, selling 237 billion, and then the household sector, which includes domestic hedge funds at 170. On the buying side, the Federal Reserve bought over $1 trillion of treasuries in the first quarter of 2020. They actually bought another trillion in the second quarter. You also see some buying from money market funds, but focused on the shorter maturities. Just to give you a sense of how historically abnormal this selling was, I'm showing you here quarterly uh, purchases or sales for these various uh, key, key players going back to 2000. To the left, you can see rest of the world. Remember that they sold almost 300 billion in the first quarter. That's abnormal. For example, during the financial crisis, they were not selling. Same with the mutual funds. They sold a lot in 2020 Q1. Financial crisis, they were not selling. The households is actually a residual category in the data set I'm using. So the data are a bit more volatile and 2020 Q1 doesn't look quite that normal. Now on the buying side to the right for the Federal Reserve, you can see the giant spike uh, illustrating how the Federal Reserve bought over a trillion in just one quarter. The prior three spikes you can see are the previous interventions on the quantitative easing rounds one, two, and three, and they were smaller certainly on a per quarter basis. 
So this, these are historically abnormal events. So let's dig into each of these uh, parties and try to understand why they were selling. Let's start with mutual funds. So mutual funds were selling because people were pulling money out of mutual funds, uh, especially in bond mutual funds. Okay, so going into the crisis, there were almost 5 trillion in bond mutual funds. They lost 255 billion of investor money. That's about 5%. That contrasts actually quite sharply with equity funds, we, which were much larger going in, but so much smaller outflows. And all kinds of bond mutual funds um, lost investors. Even more, when funds were facing outflows and had to sell assets, they disproportionately sold, at, sold treasuries. So just to give you a summary measure, a taxable bond funds sold 11% of their treasuries, but only 1% of their other bonds. This is perhaps what you would expect given that treasuries are supposed to be the safe and liquid asset that one can sell. And so that would make sense to sell that um, before digging into some more illiquid assets. These bond mutual flows were actually not that abnormal relative to the financial crisis. Uh, if you look in, in billion of outflows, the financial crisis looks small. You can see a slight spike in 2008 to the left. But if you scale by assets in the middle, and especially if you're looking quarterly data to the right, then 2020 Q1 does not look that abnormal relative to the financial crisis in terms of bond outflows. So what was different for the funds? Well, this time around, they had a lot more treasuries to sell. You can see to the left here that the amount of treasuries that mon money market funds, sorry, that mutual funds have been holding has gone up by a factor of seven since the, since the early 2000s. That's all, that's a, that increase you see, even if you scale by the size of the mutual fund sector, or even if you look at the percent of treasuries held by mutual funds to the right. Now, one possibility for why people were pulling money out of the mutual funds uh, would be what I would call a disappearing safety effect. So I have done some work arguing that investors are willing to pay extra for the ultra safe and ultra liquid assets. For example, think of an individual investor having some money to invest for retirement, but not very sophisticated and doesn't want to spend a lot of time researching particular securities. What they might want to do is to buy an investment grade bond fund, and they're willing to pay a bit extra in order to not have to do all that research. So you can think of, to the left in my picture, people being willing to pay a higher price, something extra as illustrated in the blue line, for securities with very low default probability because it's easier to think through and doesn't require a lot of information. However, then as default risk starts um, increasing, but you're gonna see that that safety effect, that that safety premium people are willing to pay is gonna start going away. People will say, look, I don't understand this. This is not what I signed up for. I thought it was investment grade. It was supposed to be safe. And now you're gonna see people pulling money out. You're gonna see the prices declining. And I think that's some of what we saw uh, in, the, in the spring. Just to illustrate this, to the left here, if you look at the investment grade bonds, the green line is a measure of default risk. It goes up some, but not much relative to the huge increase in the investment grade yield. Whereas for the riskier securities that were never subject to the safety effect, you see a large increase in both credit risk and in yields. What about the foreigners? Why were they selling? Well, most of the foreign sales, uh, which were about 300 bills for the longer maturities, were by foreign official. So central banks doing foreign exchange intervention, for example. The foreign private sector sold about a hundred billion. Now, why were the foreign officials selling? What was different? Remember, these were these guys were not selling back during the financial crisis. Well, they were actually selling; they just were not selling treasuries back then. So back then, they sold uh, mortgage-related securities, and this time around, they sold treasuries. And why? Well, just like for the mutual funds, the foreigners had become much more reliant on treasuries in their portfolios. So since uh, 2008 Q3, there has been almost a $3 trillion uh, increase in the foreign central bank's holding of US securities. And $2 trillion of that increase has been in treasuries. So in other words, the foreign central bank have loaded up on treasuries and when they needed to defend their currencies, well, they had a lot of treasuries to sell. On the foreign side, remember there was also about $100 billion of private foreign sales. Uh, sorry for the small font here, but the, the middle panel with the coloring in column four illustrates sales by country. China was the largest 
a seller, but the second largest were the Cayman Islands, which is a known hedge fund hub. So as you can see here by the color coding, the orange is countries that likely sold due to FX intervention, whereas the green are hedge fund hubs that likely sold due to hedge fund unwinding trades. The trades that have been mentioned in the debate is a trade called the treasury basis trade and also possibly what's called the risk parity trade. The treasury basis trade is a trade where you try to buy a treasury security for cheap and then sell it later in the form of entering into a short treasury futures position today to deliver the treasury later. So if the, the regular treasury is cheap relative to the treasury futures, you can make money on this, but you have to finance the treasury purchases. And if you can't roll over that financing, well, then the whole thing unwinds. And that was one of the factors that led to hedge fund selling in the spring. Uh, let me skip this one. Uh, let me just finish with a few slides about the Federal Reserve. How did the Federal Reserve uh, come in to save the market? So lo and behold, during the COVID crisis, the Fed did four things. They lowered the interest rate. They introduced facilities so that foreign foreigners could borrow dollars, foreign central banks, foreign banks could borrow dollars uh, from the Fed. There was a set of facilities to stabilize short-term money markets and a set of facilities to focus on bond markets. Now, there's a lot of dates involved, but I'm just going to to talk through three. So March 15, they lowered a bunch of interest rates and they promised that they would do a bunch of purchases of treasuries and MBS looking at the, the dysfunctional markets. March 23rd is the Fed's whatever it takes moment. Uh, they promised unlimited purchases of treasury and MBS as needed. And they even introduced facilities to buy corporate bonds and those facilities were then extended on April 9th. Now, if you take our first picture and put in three vertical lines in those three dates, they don't line up. So you see after the first vertical line, the first announcement of treasury purchases, treasury yields keep going up. And then seemingly they go back down before the Fed uh, does a lot. However, remember how I've argued that a bunch of people were selling because they needed liquidity? Well, in that scenario, maybe it doesn't work to just announce that you're gonna buy treasuries you have to actually buy the treasuries. So if we instead look at the actual purchases of the Fed, well, then things line up perfectly. So the blue line is the same as usual, the 10-year treasury. The red line now is the Federal Reserve's daily purchases of treasuries. And you can see right as the Fed kicks into high gear on March 19, buying large amounts of treasuries, then you see the treasury yield falling. And from the perspective of arguing causality, we can look at the same picture for the mortgage-backed securities market. Here, everything is moved by exactly one day. So the yields peak a day later because the Fed started very high purchases a day later. So in my mind, that was a good argument that this is really due to the Fed. So in, to sum up, there were large dislocations in the treasury market. It was not due to loss of confidence in terms of inflation or credit risk. Instead, there was lots of treasury selling due to liquidity needs. Uh, from several actors uh, that had since the financial crisis gotten more reliant on treasuries in terms of the, the bond funds and uh, the foreign central banks. The Fed saved the day. Now, finally, should we uh, regulate uh, going forward and try in order to try to stabilize market in some ex ante sense rather than in an exposed Fed intervention sense? Well, let's think through it. So it's a hard problem. So for example, we could mandate mutual funds to hold lots of liquid holdings, for example, treasuries. So they wouldn't start selling illiquid securities such as corporate bonds, where we also saw large dislocations or mortgage-backed securities. And that's pretty likely to help these non-treasury markets going forward, but that might make the treasury market dislocations even worse in the next crisis as they have even more treasuries that they can then dump on the market. On the, in terms of hedge fund leverage, there, remember, there was this basis trade that was unwound because they couldn't or wouldn't roll over the funding that led to lots of sales of treasuries. I think we need to think about not only the hedge funds, but also why did this trade open up in the first place? Why did the futures market become mispriced relative to the regular market? So there's some possibilities that perhaps, perhaps the real problem is underfunded pension plans. So, for example, if you're a pension fund and you're trying to uh, generate a high return, what one thing you can do is you can do your 
interest rate uh, hedging or your interest rate risk management in the futures market, that frees up a lot of money to invest in something with a high return, such as stocks and Vanguard, for example, I put a link here, has been marketing that to pension funds quite heavily. And finally, we cannot regulate government spending. But one of the key underlying drivers here is that there's a lot of treasury debt out there to be, to be had because we have been running large fiscal deficits. And when you have a lot of debt, some buyers will be buying for liquidity reasons and treasury demand will in general be more saturated. In that case, this increased treasury supply increases the risk of severe treasury market dislocations. We could perhaps call it fiscal dominance of monetary policy uh, through a liquidity channel just to have a new buzzword out there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Annette, for that fascinating presentation, which gives us a large amount of food for thought. Um, I'm conscious that for some of our audience, it may have been a little on the technical side. I promise, however, with this panel, we will have no problem explaining any questions you have. Feel free, please, to make use of the chat function. There are several folks on the team standing by. If people have questions, I tried to provide some running commentary on why, what the inverse relationship is between bond prices and yields, and so why one should be very alarmed at yields going up as stock prices fall, because that's indicating that bond prices are falling too, and really you want bond prices to go up as shares go down, because bonds are supposed to provide the buffer of safety in an in otherwise declining equity market. So that's where Annette's di diagnosis takes off. If there are more questions like this out there, please feel free to put them in the chat. Don't hesitate to ask us questions when we move to the Q&A section towards the end of this, of this session. This is definitely part of the effort here is after all to spread expertise and to enable people to understand the dynamics. The conclusion of this paper is, is truly fascinating and is one that Daniela Garbo and others have also been highlighting from a different angle. From a thoroughly orthodox mainstream position, the net arrives at a truly alarming proposition, which is that rather than simple political economy factors, in other words, the demands of politicians driving the subordination of central bank policy to fiscal demands, it could be the scale of the financial market action around the increased bond stock that creates such enormous risks in the financial system that the central bank has to act, which is very much in the spirit of the projects of reform and debate that we're having here. That's the kicker in this claim that you could have fiscal dominance over monetary policy, not by the traditional spendthrift populist popul politician trying to run a deficit and needing somebody to monetize it, but by way of the fact that the financial system could be so gorged on government debt that it would have indigestion and would need backup with very large consequences to the balance sheet of the central banks. So this is a hugely significant debate. I would love to get Martin and Sven's perspectives. Perhaps we'll start with Martin, as it were, to form a, a segue. Martin has had a leading role in, talk, in, in conversations about financial stability, both in Europe and worldwide. Martin, how do you see the events of March? Um, uh, how seriously should we take this as a challenge? I'd like to make a few remarks remarks on that. First, on your point about financial dominance, I think that's been the main theme since 2008. So uh, much of the discussion about fiscal versus financial uh, is besides the point. But now one thing that was missing in Annette's presentation was the question, what was the motivation, say, of a hedge fund liquidating things? Was this a consequence of being forced to liquidate because of withdrawals? Or was this a consequence of wanting to liquidate because of concerns about what was going on? If it's the former, and Annette made one remark about withdrawals playing a role, then we need to think about the role of hedge funds as intermediaries in this system which is where we get to the question, what's the difference between hedge funds and banks? The standard view is hedge funds are not so risky uh, in term for the system because whereas banks can become insolvent, hedge funds cannot. It's not Just actually- Martin, for our audience, the difference is that hedge funds have 
basically they take money in, they invest the money. If you make the losses, the hedge fund absorbs the loss, the shareholders take the loss. There's not leverage right. and therefore right. the possibility of a of an insolvency like with a bank. Right. That's 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 right. That's ex yeah. exactly the point. Now there this is of course one reason why regulation of funds altogether uh, has been quite different from regulation of banks. Except uh, the assessment that they're really all that different is superficial. First, one of the problems with banks is they have illiquid assets. And if there is a run on the bank, then the bank cannot liquidate those assets and has a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, if a hedge fund has a ready redemption, an immediate redemption policy, exactly the same thing can happen. And that played a major role last March. Uh, and in Europe as well, I gather, right? There are several e funds e types e in e Europe. E that e the everywhere. Sort of problem. Everywhere. And the runs problem can happen with hedge funds as well. By the way, also hedge funds can be uh, can become insolvent if they lever. And of course, uh, levered lending was one of the main themes in the run-up to last spring. So levered lending is when you when you want to make more profit on a trade. So you take your capital and say, on the basis of my capital, I'd like to borrow three times my capital, and then I can increase my bet by three times. And so the profit will be three times larger, and then I pay the loan off. But the problem, of course, is the losses could also be three times larger if you, if you, if you make losses, right? Exactly. And I mean, knowing that, and seeing that something really bad was happening. After all, uh, Corona was a really big shock. Uh, yeah. Caused people to make use of immediate redemption. Yes. Uh, so we, we then have to ask the question, uh, what kind of arrangement is this? More precisely, how do we deal with the macro dimension of risk? Who's bearing the macro risk? How much do we have? And this brings me to my second point. Intermediation, whether by banks or by funds, provides a wonderful domain for what I call flawed narratives. You tell the investors that what you're offering them is riskless, and doesn't require them to uh, put their money in for a, a long time without being able to get it out. And at the same time, they can earn money. Actually, uh, one of the sort of flawed uh, ideas in this involves the use of 10-year bonds for liquidity purposes. Yeah. Uh, some 40 years ago, short-term treasuries would have served that purpose. But of course, if you don't, if you earn nothing on short-term treasuries, then earning next to nothing on 10-year bonds uh, is wonderful. And of course, the difference between 10 years and short-term is not, doesn't really matter because the underlying uh, borrower is safe. When we say, Martin, when we say you're using a 10-year bond for liquidity purposes, what we're saying is, that a fund which thinks it might have sudden withdrawals with people taking their cash out, like a bank, like a bank deposit, will hold a bunch of US 10-year treasuries, the ones that Annette was talking about, yes. knowing that under normal circumstances, it can sell them like that for cash. And in the meantime, it makes an interest margin, which is better than nothing. But what you're doing is treating something that won't pay off from the government for 10 years as equivalent to cash. So it's a hair-raising, um, a mismatch really of, of liabilities and, and assets on the balance sheet of people using these. So long as the market for treasuries works, there's always somebody else out there who will buy them. It, it, it's a brilliant device, but it does depend on the stability, which as Annette was showing was just not there. Uh, except, I mean, there you can go one step further, which is the 10 year bond always has interest rate risk. If market rates of interest go up, the 10-year bond loses in value. And uh, 
of course, we all know that central banks will prevent the market rate uh, of uh, interest from going up for precisely that reason. Mm -hmm. But uh, we should be aware that this kind of moral hazard is there anyway. But now, the, 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 the underlying conceptual point is you can only earn money by engaging in macro risk. Macro risk is where the risk premia are. So uh, the game that the industry plays is to tell a story as to why what they are doing is not risky. Risks are hidden. Remember those mortgage-backed securities that had no risk because there was averaging across homeowners in Texas and New York? And yet we saw that, that they did have risk. And I mean, my view of systemic risk is systemic risk comes from some financial institution taking macro risk and telling a flawed narrative about it. And the regulator's challenge really should be uncover the flaws and the narratives that people tell. Don't delude yourself that you can measure systemic risk. It's more a matter of understanding where are they hiding the trouble this time? Thank you so much. That's great. And I think it provides a great segue to Sven Giegold, who, from coming from the political side, after all, <laughs> this issue of flawed narratives is surely key, is it not, to understanding also the broader politics of this investment and financial system? <laughs> well, um, look, uh, the whole research uh, Annette presented and uh, Martin has put additionally into perspective reminds me very much of my studies at university on financial markets. And, uh, and the key point here was that the, myth, the German myth, uh, so the central bank, it, it has a very limited mandate and actually is not usually acting discretionary, but only rules-based, that this is proven wrong here, right? Uh, so the central bank um, has been forced uh, to guarantee also financial market stability and um, or at least it felt compelled to do so. Uh, I would uh, therefore say that uh, logically because the central bank uh, has this uh, de facto function that there is a very strong argument why those actors who can indirectly force the public central bank to do this uh, have to be regulated and supervised. And of course, here we have a scattered landscape. We have banks which are at least supervised. They are not enough regulated. So we always agreed with Martin Helwig that they are de facto still undercapitalized. Uh, and uh, so the leverage ratio of the European banking system is just a bit above 5%. And but when it comes to the funds, uh, be it hedge funds, uh, money market funds, but also mutual funds, the rules are really not uh, straight. So what Martin was uh, touching upon, some of these funds do things which should normally be done by banks. And, uh, and the rules are not set straight. So for instance, if you promise uh, to redempt at a certain moment in time, and even worse, like for instance, with a part of the money market funds, even for a certain fixed value, then you de facto take risk like a bank. And, uh, and there would be a long lecture here on insurances, where we have also a bank-like behavior, but a lot less regulation when it comes to uh, rules, at least on capital. And, uh, and this means, I think, we have to get the categories right. So uh, that means uh, funds should behave like funds and banks should behave like banks. And, and funds may not make promises they cannot hold. Uh, and also funds, I would say, need rules on liquidity, on, on leverage ratios. Uh, and um, this was actually fought by the parliament. After the crisis, the parliament wanted 
for what we call AIFs, so alternative investment funds. We wanted limits to leverage. And uh, this was defeated by a strong lobby in the Council of Member States in the EU, led by the UK at the time. Uh, and uh, I could go on with more examples like this, but I think it's needed to, to clarify uh, who is a bank, what is a fund, and what can funds do, under which rules, and have stricter rules on what we call shadow banking. And on the other hand, clarifying that if it's still the case that financial markets are inherently unstable, there should be attacks on the activity of the financial markets to compensate the public for the guarantee risk which we are taking. So, uh, and that is uh, so far missing conceptually. So there is a, a free insurance premium for many of the players which should be compensated by a financial transaction tax. So uh, these would be a few first remarks on what has been said. Thank you so much, Sven. That, that was that was that was great. Could perhaps it will be worth because spelling out quite what the blackmail consists of, because at the heart of your of your of your excellent remarks is this sense that, as it were, the move by the central bank to backstop is in the end forced. And so because of the systemic risk being generated by this private activity, this externality has not been internalized and it needs to be internalized through some form of tax. Annette, could you give us an impression of what would happen if this was simply allowed to unfold without Fed intervention? You make a compelling case that those Fed moves, you know, show up in the data on the right moment. So we have, as it were, something that looks like causality here. What if they don't go in? What is the what is the imaginary nightmare that motivates this action? Yeah, I think it's easy to sort of criticize the hedge funds and the mutual funds and so forth. We have to keep in mind that in the end they're owned by people. You know, so I gave the example of a small retail investor wanting to invest in a mutual fund. In the end, the small investors would also have been hurt if we had not at the Fed step in and save the treasury market because the mutual funds that those small investors were holding would have fallen more. And the small investors would not be in the best position to time the market and figuring out when should I sell in a fallen market. So, you know, it's not all only about the big guys, it's also about the small guys. So it is important to get the right structures. So this is, that would be a price adjustment story. In other words, the price of treasuries would go down, people would take losses, there'd be a distributional hit from the fact that some investors are better equipped to deal with the falling market. Is there some disruptive thing that we're worried about? Are the threshold effects? Does this snowball in some disastrous way? Are there at some point heavily leveraged balance sheets like bank balance sheets that get in trouble if the treasury market is as unstable as it was appearing? Because the just the loss, you could say, OK, fine. The main concern would be if you had a treasury auction that failed. Right? I mean, then we, would, then we would be in really serious trouble and the US would look a lot less safe than it has been. And I wanted to just, just touch on two things. So, you know, I think Martin is completely right that holding 10-year treasuries for liquidity purposes is a bit of a stretch. Uh, historically, you know, bonds have moved up and stocks went down, but that's of course not something one could take for granted. But going back to the whole issue of, of funding government debt, you know, if we incentivize a bunch of financial players to hold short maturity treasuries, and according the government starts shortening the maturities that it's issued, then, you know, what happens if we're in a crisis and the US government has to roll over, you know, several trillion dollars in the middle of a crisis on short notice, you know, then are we just moving financial instability, you know, from one bucket to the other one? That's something I think needs, you know, a lot of thought. And I'm, the other thing I wanted to touch on is I'm a little less negative on than Sven is on market-based financing. You know, we in Europe have for a long time said, you know, our com small companies, our big companies are too reliant on one or two big banks. You know, we have lots of evidence that if then that one big bank gets into trouble, then there's real consequences 
for the firms that are borrowing, for the employer, for the workers in those firms. The idea of market-based financing has always been to try to make you not be stuck with one bank and you know borrow from a diversified set of people who can invest in a diversified set of investments. I think we should inherently welcome that, you know, in the sense that that makes the worker in the end, the companies in the end safer. You know, of course we need those markets to work well, but I think the, the starting point should not be banks are better for companies than markets. It depends on what kind of company you, you know, you're looking at. For a large firm where it's a lot of people are, are already researching their stocks, for example, having those guys financed by corporate bonds might be fine. For a smaller company, you know, you might prefer a bank since the, the cost of just understanding the business is to some extent a fixed cost. So I'm, a, I'm much less negative on market-based financing, but of course, you know, in, in the right structural framework. Martin, do you want to come back on, on the flow of uh, discussion so far? Uh, yes. On the question of banks versus funds, I'm basically neutral. I think both are experts at producing flawed narratives. And the problem with the small investors is they fall victim to those. And, and it is right that much of the central bank intervention uh, may contribute to uh, helping small investors together with large investors. Now your question, what would happen without a central bank intervention gets in many ways back to 29 to 33 where central bank interventions were very much reduced for, for the most part and I mean, these, these, these are numbers that we cannot imagine anymore today. Uh, GDP in uh, many of the uh, major industrial economies declined by real GDP, declined by numbers on the order of uh, one third. Uh, that's uh, a multiple of what we've seen both in 2009 and uh, last year. So uh, the, the real question is to what extent the implications of a negative shock, and there always is scope for negative macro shocks. To what extent will those implications be limited? And to what extent do we allow pro-cyclical systemic mechanisms to just exacerbate what was going on. If, we, if I take last March, Corona raised questions about, well, made it clear that there would be losses, raised questions about who will be bearing those losses and what does that do to my investments? So rather than wait and see, people uh, try to say, uh, let's take what the loss losses we already have and get out. Now that getting out may exacerbate the damage and uh, not just the financial damage, but also real damage because things like payment mechanisms uh, and, and, and so on get disturbed. And this is where the central bank steps in. And the real question uh, about the central bank I mean, to some extent, uh, financial dominance is unavoidable. But the real question is, uh, do they have to behave like those stupid bankers in Dusseldorf that Michael Lewis uh, presented as the typical buyer of some strange mortgage-backed securities produced by American investment bankers? Are they just helpless sitting ducks waiting for something bad to happen and then to rescue the system? Or are there ways in which they can reduce their exposure through regulation? Now on that question, which Sven has uh, also uh, raised, my point about the flawed narratives is don't trust too much in a fixed set of regulations. Equity is good because it's unspecific. But anything that's specific uh, 
just provides incentives to invent a new flawed narrative which gets around that particular regulation. Think much more in terms of what incentives do these guys have to do things where they fool everybody, including themselves, about the risks that they are taking. So one of the questions that we have in the, from the chat here is the question of whether effectively, if you and Annette, in your pessimism about regulation, converge on a kind of ad hoc role for the central bank when called upon, is it appropriate for us to simply mandate the central bank as a market maker of last resort um, and just acknowledge that as part of its, of its functions? Sven, would that be in your, you know, would that be within the sort of realm of your imagined role for the central bank with a clear, as it were, payment to the public sector for this service? Well, I, I first have to set one point straight because perhaps I was not really clear. I was not arguing a priori against uh, market financing. And uh, I was not saying, let's go back to borrowing banking, destroy everything else, and then the world is safe. Uh, I don't believe it because actually borrowing banking can be pretty risky. And we have seen it in economic history. So therefore, um, my, my take would be more agnostic. I would say, look, uh, there are different uh, actors but we should uh, clearly define who is doing what. Uh, so when you have a bank, you should know what a bank is. And if you have a money market fund, you should know it's a fund. So there should be no fixed redemption value because this is what banks do. And, uh, and uh, the same with different other types uh, of financial actors. So the, get the definition straight. If you have a mutual fund, uh, like our USITS model in Europe, we should not allow them to use 10% of their assets to buy derivatives and have a lever, which is uh, often larger than the investment they do uh, with the 90%, so the risk they take. So let's define clearly what is a usage, what is a, an alternative investment fund, what is a bank. And then if we agree, like also in the questions, that the central bank for all these actors has a certain stabilizing role because uh, then they all have to accept regulation and supervision, including appropriate limits to leverage and liquidity, always keeping the Helvig rule in mind. Nobody knows uh, what really risk is. Uh, and therefore we should be on the more prudent side uh, to claim we know from the past, what will be risky in the future, we don't. So be rather blunt in the way how we define risk in regulation. Also because states are less clever than they think. So when you believe the state is not as intelligent as uh, often people uh, would like to see it, then the rules should be relatively e blunt. And lastly, even the best supervision and regulation will not achieve. Uh, and therefore, there has to be a fee and, uh, uh, and uh, for the negative externality. But I was not saying with these remarks uh, and that I'm against market financing. Mm -hmm. I doubt only one thing. I doubt that small and medium-sized enterprises, and Annette said it as well, are best served by the market because of information asymmetry and uh, problems, banks are usually better in order to finance uh, SMEs. But uh, for many other purposes, markets may be better. And I'm in favor of a capital markets union in Europe. And I think we should develop it in parallel to the banking union. But I hope when we do this, we supervise and regulate it uh, more coherently than what we did with the banking union. So, but, but the idea is right for the reasons Annette uh, explained. So it's opening financing opportunities. Annette, where would you stand on this issue as it were mandating it, making explicit the market maker role um, in so central banking? I'm, 
I'm concerned about the moral hazard implications of this in the sense that if you took highly levered companies that have high yield bonds outstanding and you said, you know, if the yield on high yield bonds goes above, above X percent, the Fed's going to step in and buy your bonds. This creates very bad incentives for them to, for investors to say, well, you know, we're never going to see a default on high yield bonds. The Fed will buy them before the default. So we cannot go out and give a blanket promise that says the Fed will always save everyone from default. I think that's a bad idea. However, I think we should distinguish between, you know, large sophisticated investors and smaller retail investors. Small investors historically invested in banks because they were unsophisticated and they were willing to take low returns on deposits in order to not have to deal with their financing. Now they invest in mutual funds instead. And for banks, we have deposit insurance for the reasons that it's hard to not bail out the grandmothers once there's a run on the bank and we probably should bail out the grandmother and therefore we charge for it, right? The banks and in the end, the depositors pay for the insurance. That's a more reasonable model, you know, not for hedge funds, you know, or buyers of high yield corporate bonds, but for retail investors in money market funds, perhaps even institutional investors in money market funds and in safer mutual funds say, look, we're going to bail you out if something happens. Therefore, we're going to set up a system such as deposit insurance. We cannot go out and give a blanket promise that the Fed will always save everyone. Then that might lead to more safety in the short run, but then we'll just have more build up of borrowing and leverage. And in the long run, you know, things will actually get less stable. May I make a comment on this, Adam? Yes, please. I, I agree with you, but I would say it's the same with banks. So also with central, the central bank, also in the more traditional function of lender of last resort, was never giving a defined guarantee because otherwise you could speculate against that mm -hmm. position. The same would be with this market making function, but we should accept that if the stability of the financial system is at stake, it can be so expensive for the central bank not to act that it needs to embrace that function. But of course, we may never define clearly when we are intervening and when we will not be intervening so that a certain risk remains that actors do not know, will the central bank act, when will it act, and so on. But what we can clearly say, what we can't do is what our constitutional court demands. So uh, to limit our um, the realm of central banking to something so mechanical in, in a sense uh, that it's not up to the task of uh, modern financial systems. So the next question I would like to ask is, if in some sense it makes sense to all of us, I think, that there needs to be a central bank actor which has to preserve a fair measure of discretion because of the gaming problem, and that is indeed a public service, and then in some senses this should be compensated, who would we end up paying that compensation to? Would it in fact involve all of us paying the Americans? Um, so is this a problem that, as it were, we could imagine happening? So Annette incredibly clearly figured, you know, in the opening slides, the purpose of those opening slides was to say, look, this isn't a problem with US treasuries as such. This isn't some worry about Trump, nor is it a worry about an American inflationary explosion. What happens is, a liquidity squeeze inside the global financial system, including lots of non-American actors, which reverberates into the one market, which everyone assumes is basically available, available to absorb any amount of sales. And it turns out it can't. Can we imagine a run like that in a European sovereign debt market? And if not, is that because ultimately everyone in the global system is relying on the dollar, on the dollar, on the dollar system? So to a kind of a two-level question, could we imagine a liquidity run like this in Europe? Um, and what is the relationship between, as it were, the dollar-based liquidity system and that of, of the rest of the world? Because I think the political economy of that becomes quite tricky. And it seems to me that one of the things we've left tacit, and it's really a force by Sven's point, is that if there's free riding going on, it's to a large extent on the United States. This was true in 2008-9 as well, after all. And there are lots of complicated ways of working one ways around that. But anyway, um, Annette, could you see the possibility of, a, of this sort of liquidity run in the Eurozone? 
I mean, I think there are examples of this. It's not the case that everyone were relying on US treasuries for their liquid asset. You know, so when people were taking money out of corporate bond funds or bond funds in Sweden, yeah. you know, they they were holding different Swedish securities that they were then selling and, and causing illiquidity in. Uh, there were even some, although much smaller dislocations in the bonds market in Germany. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I think a lot of the, a lot of the issues are actually quite similar across countries. Isabel Schnabel gave a recent speech laying out very similar problems of mutual fund withdrawals in the European context. And I suspect a lot of those mutual funds were not holding US treasuries for liquidity purposes. So I think it's a more broad issue that whatever is the liquid asset in a crisis, you know, is put to a test whether the amount of selling is so large that it no longer is liquid. And for the sake of keeping the system going, that's where there is a role for central banks to step in. But as Sven said, we had to keep what the, the central bankers, you know, call the discretion, they call it constructive ambiguity. There has to be some lack of certainty about when the central banks will step in. There's another, there's another meme which is floating around, particularly the American debate, which is that, um, which links the problems of bank stability and fund instability together in a rather kind of perverse way. And the argument is that basically, if the banks had been less constrained, they could have absorbed more of the shock. So this was an argument that has been fairly consistently advanced by one particular bank. JP Morgan has been particularly vociferous on this score. They have historically, they have played the role of, as it were, a shock absorber in the US Treasury market going back 100 year years. And they basically were fingered as, as part of the disruption in the American repo market that happened in 2019. Um, is this, Martin, you really, this is very much your metier, is this something that we need to take seriously as, a, as an argument that, as it were, remove risk in one part of the system, displace it into another, and does that then put the central bank in the frame as the ultimate absorber of these sorts of shocks? Or should we dismiss this as tendentious, self-serving, a way really of unhinging Basel III or Basel IV um, on the part of self-interested banks? Such arguments arise always. The real question is, and this is where I want to get back to my initial statement, what kind of system are we talking about? And do we have to take these risks as given? Uh, and I think here we must distinguish between say liquidity risks or risks to liquidity and uh, underlying uh, risk allocation. On one point uh, there, I would like to come back actually on, on, on one point that Sven Giegold uh, made, the problem uh, about uh, redemptions is not just the question of values, redemption values. Uh, this was an issue with the reserve primary money market fund after the Lehman bankruptcy and similar funds. So this but, is about whether the fund promises to give you a dollar back if you put a dollar in. That, that's not the issue. That's not the issue, yeah. The, the issue is that if the markets for the assets held by the fund don't work well, and the fund offers immediate redemption, then there is an issue at what value, and even the determination of that value may cause trouble. We've had scandals with open and real estate funds in Germany uh, in connection with uh, the time lags in entering changes in valuations uh, of those real estate uh, assets uh, into the books, uh, which led to uh, strange uh, outcomes for the investors. But the real problem is that the notion, I promise a fair share of the assets I, I hold. That's only well defined if markets work as well as say uh, the big American stock markets. For real estate, it doesn't work. For uh, fixed interest securities, it sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work. So uh, that uh, discrepancy uh, 
in combination with the right to have to immediate re redemption is always a potential source of trouble. But in addressing the issue, also the issue of what's the role of the central bank concerning the mandate, I don't think they need a mandate. It's implicit in the mandate they have and they've been using it. Mm -hmm. But there is a deeper question. Suppose we have an enormous demand for safe assets, which is one of the characteristics of developments of the past two decades. How do we deal with that when there are very few safe assets around? And this gets to the role of the central bank as the supplier of money. The only really nominally safe asset is money. Mm -hmm. Should the central bank supply that? Or should it not supply that? And according to the monetarist Friedman Schwartz view of say 1929 uh, following, uh, have the economy move through a, a big deflation in order to get a high real value of the money that's around. Uh, I mean, so under, un underlying this, uh, th this discussion about the central bank and asset markets, we do also have this macro question, uh, how do central banks meet the challenge of a big increase in the demand for safe assets. Some of what we've seen in the financial system in the past 15 years has just been a way of playing this out. Mm -hmm. if, if I may, uh, um, to tease out the sort of implications and perhaps the political implications of what we've been saying, we've had a sort of conversation. I mean, at one point, Annette said, well, you mustn't forget that people own these investment vehicles. And then we have a conversation about different types of investors. And Martin, you tell a compelling story about um, misleading narratives, false narratives, essentially. But I wonder whether we don't need to be, in a sense, sharper and more precise in our sociology and our political economy. I mean, aren't we, aren't we dealing with, if you believe the wealth distribution data, a small fraction of the population in any society amongst the high powered, highly levered, fast moving, engaged investors are a really small fraction of the population, maybe one, two, three percent maximum that are truly engaged in this project. That's where all the risk is. That's where all the wealth is. This is a group in society which can presumably take its knocks, nor is it collectively large enough to, as it were, make a difference sociologically, frankly, compared with the class of people who work in retail or some large sociological segment like that. Aren't we in a sense engaged in a kind of obfuscation of the underlying, let's name it as it is, a kind of class politics here, which is driving a system of massive self-dealing and risk generation, um, which has systemic implications, but whose of course, Sam, I mean, whose benefits at least are almost entirely internalized within a very small group of the population. That isn't to say it doesn't have systemic ramifications and that if this breaks, other things don't break too, but the immediate issue affects a small group of people. Is that a, is that a too simple view or, or unhelpfully simple? Annette, you, un, you uncovered, and then I'll bring Sven yeah, so, in. This was a... you know, I think if you think about ownership of the stock market, it is true the top 1% own something like a third of the market. But if you think more broadly, as we have moved away from government pensions or what's called defined benefit company pensions into pensions where people own their own retirement assets, if you look at data from the OECD across many countries, certainly many European countries, you have seen that a lot of people actually, regular people, not just academics and professors and people working for hedge funds, but just regular people are putting a lot of their money into retirement accounts. And if in the Danish case, this pension wealth now is 300, over 300% of GDP. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, it's certainly about the top 1%, but it's also about all the rest of us who every month we take a bit of our paycheck and we put it into a, a So that's retirement. about the top half maybe. Yeah, but I think we need to think about it, you know, in a more politically savvy way in the sense that you're trying to make something more stable, you want to give incentives to do the right thing. So, you know, there's a long debate about should there be a tax advantage to debt versus equity. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we could discuss how can we restructure the tax system in a 
in a tax neutral way. So the total amount of taxes are paid that are paid is the same as before, but we incentivize good behavior. So for example, one could in envision that if you invest in a mutual fund where you can get your money out on an instant notice, you face a different tax rate mm -hmm. than if you invest in a fund where you can only get out your money you know, yeah. over a longer period of time. That would be Sven's idea, really, right? Let's tax everyone and then no one will do anything and the economy will fall apart for lack of financing. You know, let's give people incentives, change the incentive. I think the challenge should be in a tax neutral way, how do we give people the right incentives by having higher tax rates for the behavior that has high externalities and lower tax rate for the behavior that has smaller externalities. I think that should be a starting principle. Start from tax neutrality and then tweak things in terms of the relative taxation of debt versus equity and the relative taxation of short versus longer maturity or short versus long redemption period investing. So Sven, this would be, I wanna bring you in here because that would be in a sense, uh, an approach to your issue of internalizing the externalities of risk taking that will be aiming at the, the ultimate source of, the, of, the, of, of, of those decisions. In other words, the households that were engaged in it. Well, uh, so first uh, on the debt uh, versus equity um, uh, issue, I agree that this is uh, one important flaw, uh, how we deal with, in particular, corporate finance. And uh, uh, however, there are two solutions how to get out of it. And uh, of course, uh, a lot of the business lobby in Europe uh, pushes very hard uh, that there should be a tax advantage for holding equity. Uh, on the other hand, you can also um, balance it out by uh, ensuring that advantages which come with debt financing, the deductibility of the interest from your return is limited. So uh, there could also com be compromises, but that this, so this problem is causing more unstable company financing structures. I agree and, uh, and it should be tackled. But what Annette was saying, uh, from my perspective is quite right because I do not like these sociological approaches to say, ah, oh, the financial markets, this is only 2% of population, they are all bastards and we should uh, crush them with an anti-capitalist throwing of sociological books. So uh, that is, uh, I think, uh, not was never my position. I think financial markets are needed uh, in, um, in the market economy. And uh, the whole point is how to regulate them correctly and how to make sure that they pay their own bill. At the moment, they don't pay their own bill, which annoys me since a long time. And unfortunately, the last financial crisis we failed uh, to get the financial transaction tax. If we would have it on the global level, of course, most of it would be paid to the US taxpayer. That would be quite rightly so, but also in Europe, would, it would be paid. What I think is a critical point is about your financial market class politics approach. That, and that is perhaps also a difference from a Danish perspective. Uh, in Denmark, the way how ordinary people save for old age is much better organized uh, than in Germany. And it's even better organized in Sweden. So in some Scandinavian countries, people can invest at low cost in highly effective um, capital market oriented funds. In Germany, if you buy share shares into equity, you pay 2% per year on your uh, money invested. Swedish and uh, Danish collectively organized savers pay only a fraction of that. In Sweden, you pay 0 0.2, 0.1% on the publicly organized uh, savings um, you, uh, fa pension fund system. And that is what we call as German Green Citizens Fund. We should democratize the access to the capital markets with funds which can invest into companies, strengthen their equity, and at the same time, don't come with these excessive fees, which no professional investor would ever pay. So good regulation, access for those who want. And if we want to have a more equal distribution, which we would like to have, 
the best tool is to use tax policy rather than crushing the financial markets, this is not effective from a regulation theory point of view. So against inequality, you need a fair tax system, a fair wage system, and against um, a, a risk, a risk, no, an unfair insurance system for those who work on financial markets, you have to have a tax targeting to them and regulation, uh, which is appropriate. So I think not confusing everything is, is better. And last remark, perhaps, Adam, for you, because you are a historian, I think, aren't you? So at least you are, have a, you are very, yeah. We had a time when we used very questionable arguments against actors on financial markets. And I think at least the plural, plural left uh, in, um, in Germany should not repeat that mistake. I mean, the problem with that argument, the separation of the income inequality from wealth inequality is that you, in a sense, may be underestimating, I think, the dyna dynamic effect of wealth inequality in its own right. So, No, uh, I agree. I agree. Um, and therefore, you need a tax right. on wealth. Ma oh, well, Martin, I want, to, I want to bring you here on the, uh, maybe on a final comment. I'm, I'm conscious of time because I know the organizers have a tight handover. So, um, Martin, would you like to make a final comment on this issue of intervention, stabilization, and perhaps its social and distributional consequences? On the social distributional consequences, I would just advise to take another look at 1929 to 33. The fraction of the population that was really involved with the stock market crash was quite small. Mm -hmm. But the major damage was in those mil for those millions of unemployed on the streets. On the issue, the, the basic issue of stabilization, uh, one thought, since a major issue uh, concerns liquidity, change arrangements between central banks and financial institutions in such a way that financial institutions have incentives to hold reserves with the central bank. Uh, at this point, uh, some of my, coll my German colleagues will say this re it requires exploding the central bank money supply even more and is highly inflationary. Of course, it's not highly inflationary if these guys hold reserves. Mm -hmm. And that's the basic idea of Friedman's optimum quantity of money. Money is something that can be produced costlessly, not because printing is so cheap, but because its value depends only on the demand. If you create the demand, if you make it cheap, for everyone to tide over frictions. That may actually reduce the need for active interventions because the cash reserves are being held anyway. Annette, can I give the final word to you? You started us off with your opening statement on the, on the crisis. What do you hope uh, you, you, you left it sort of open, you ended on an unresolved note what, what would you like to see happen so as to avoid this kind of a shock striking us again? I think we need to sort out what we think about large amounts of government debt. This is the key unresolved question, right? The debate now is whether we should spend vast amounts trying to get out of the current crisis. You know, interest rates are low. We can. We can have lots of government debt out there and it's not going to cause problems, you know, or whether we should take a deep breath and think about, okay, what is the kind of spending that has the highest social return? Okay, so we had a debate yesterday whether, you know, you do better subsidizing childcare, pre-K childcare with high quality childcare, which is shown to have huge social return, or you give people you know, stimulus checks in the current environment when they can't really spend them on services produced by workers in your own country, you end up importing a bunch of plastic from somewhere that you throw out the next year. You know, I think that's the key issue that we cannot, we cannot think about the current crisis and the current 
even lower real interest rates than usual as a as sort of a blanket check. We need to get back to to thinking about really what is the kind of government spending that has the highest social return. And I feel like that's the that's the issue that has gotten a little bit lost here in the in the firefighting. And I would want much more discussion of that um, going forward. Thank you very much. This has been really a, a fascinating conversation. <laughs> I really, I, I'm extraordinarily grateful to the Heinrich Bell Stiftung of Finance Vendor for bringing it together. I think you're doing really the Lord's work in enabling this kind of conversation to take place across the Atlantic um, um, and uh, opening up a whole variety of different connections that Aneta has just brought out as well between the highly technical issues of the functioning of particular bond markets and extremely real world issues in terms of the government and public expenditure that those ultimately enable us to finance. So thank you to all of the panelists for such a thoughtful, serious conversation. Um, it's been a real pleasure to see you all again, meet you in some cases and to, to host this. And I'm gonna pass back to Jörg, who I see has just popped up for a organizational interlude. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Adam. Uh, yes, I just have to do a few quick announcements. We have a few minutes left. At um, half past four CET, we continue with the workshop sessions. They take place in a different Zoom room, so you need to log out and log in again with the access details uh, that you have uh, received uh, in your emails and also in the uh, chat. So. Uh, workshop one, European civil society and central banking. Workshop two, the collateral supply effect on central bank policy. And workshop three, on uh, uh, central bank digital currency possibilities for a digital euro. So a few minutes and we are off again in the different workshops. Thank you very much for your attention and stay with us. <laughs>